All right, everyone. Everyone having a good conference? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited to be here with you today uh, and get to see all of you in person. It's, it's really great to be back together and to be uh, in Europe and to be here in France with the Scala community here. So thank you so much for having me. And I'm really excited to be able to hopefully give us a, a strong closeout to our conference here and hopefully also not take too long so we can get to the party because I know I'm the last thing standing between us and that. Uh, so the first thing I want to do actually is uh, give a, a Scala thank you here uh, to Martin Oderski for creating this uh, language that all of us are programming in and either get, getting joy, maybe getting, maybe getting income out of, um, but I think it's a real credit that we are having an entire conference about something that uh, you created and this isn't even the only conference this year, there's another one just uh, next month. Um, I've always been uh, struck uh, by, uh, I found all the code that you've written to be very elegant and uh, I'll, I'll say beautiful if you if you let me uh, <laughs> wax wax poetic a bit, and in the sense of you kind of read it and it says exactly what it does, and not in a kind of cute way of well, let me have one line that's super long and has a lot of underscores, but in a way of I just read it and I understand it and I say I see what it does, uh, and I think along with that and maybe related to that is a focus on usability, which I think we all heard this morning in, uh, in the keynote about uh, simply uh, Scala. Uh, so I think that's all really, really fantastic. Uh, and I think maybe part of that is also it's created something that I'll, I've, I've chosen my word judiciously here, something worth debating. Uh, I think sometimes, hopefully, we, we discuss. That's probably a more productive term. Maybe sometimes we fight, and that's not as productive. But I think whatever word we use, the fact that we spend the time to all really voice our opinions and try to figure out what's right with this language reflects that this is something that is valuable and is worth putting that time into. Um, uh, in addition to that, at least in all of my interactions, that Martin's just been a very genuinely nice guy. Um, I have this email that, this is actually back from 2018. Uh, so this was before I started contributing to Zio, basically, I think before I was anyone in the Scala community. But I think years before I had taken the, the Coursera uh, course on Scala, and there was one of these sections on functional reactive programming, and uh, there had been a note in there about how uh, it would be nicer if we could get rid of this global mutable variable, if we could pass this thing around implicitly, but we couldn't quite do that. Um, and then, of course, Dottie at the time, and now Scala 3 came along, and we could with implicit function types, and I kind of did a little mini gist about this, and I sent it to him, and literally the next day, he, he responded back with a, with a very nice note. Um, so I think part of that thank you is thank you for just being a, being a good person and I think a position of authority where sometimes people don't have to be. Um, so again, thank you. All right, so let's, uh, let's get down to it here. So the title of this talk is Moving On Up. And I think the logical first question you might have is, what are we moving up with respect to? And what we're talking about here is moving up with respect to the software stack. And so there's this quote by Isaac Newton, actually, that I think is really applicable to software development in general where he said, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think for him, he was talking about physics and mathematics, but I think it very much applies to software, where we think about anything we're doing, and if we're able to do anything in a somewhat rational and principled and reasonable way, it's because we're working on top of lots of other levels that are each in a hopefully rational and principled way 
dealing with the concerns of each of those levels. Um, and so that can go from, you know, we've got an application that is built on a lower level application to eventually we're built on a language which is built on a bunch of hardware which is built on a semiconductor industry that has made amazing progress in shrinking the size of all of these chips. Uh, but for these purposes, we'll focus really just on kind of the stack within the Scala language uh, or within a language in general. And so if we just explore this concept of a stack, we could say, okay, we have these different layers where each layer is built on top of that next lower level layer. And that lower level layer is in turn built on a layer even below that. So a simple example might be we have some web service that is implemented in terms of an HTTP framework. And the HTTP framework in turn, if it wants to be concurrent and reactive and all of these things, it's implemented in terms of a concurrency framework. And then that concurrency framework is in turn implemented in terms of the Scala language itself. And one way we would think about this is if you've, if you've heard of the term of like the onion architecture in terms of application architecture, this is really the onion architecture at the level of a software community. So just like in our application, we might say, well, our business logic is implemented in terms of a user layer, and the user layer is implemented in terms of some kind of persistence service, and that's implemented in terms of, okay, here's an actual database we're working with. This is the same thing, but at the level of libraries. And so one question we could ask ourselves there is what makes a good component of that software stack? What does it mean to be a good citizen, so to speak, uh, as one of these components that is going to be implemented in terms of lower level components and is in turn going to be used by higher level components? And I would suggest there are, there are three criteria we could think about for that. Uh, so the first one is what I would call completeness, that all of the functionality within this domain, however we define it, is provided by this component. So if this component is an HTTP framework, it provides all the functionality that we might need for what we would call a HTTP problem. Now there's some subjectivity here because we might define the edges of our domains differently and we might debate whether one thing should really fall within one domain or another, but conceptually we can say for some definition of the domain, a good component should fulfill all of that functionality. The second criteria would be what I would call being high level. And I think another way you could think about this is in more of like an object oriented uh, conceptualization, encapsulation, that you shouldn't have to drop down to lower level layers to solve some problem at the level of this layer. So for example, if I take Zio, Zio is a concurrency framework. Zio provides a data type called a ref that is a mutable reference. Uh, if you're working with Zio, you shouldn't have to drop down and use a Java util concurrent atomic reference. If you have to do that, that's a failure of Zio to provide abstractions to allow you to operate at the Zio layer and not drop down to a lower layer. And finally, each of these components should be what I would call principled, which means that the operators they expose follow, we could call them laws, we could call them API contracts, but uh, behave in a way that allows higher level components to also uh, provide specified behavior that has strong guarantees. So if we take the Zio example again, if Zio provides guarantees around resource safety, those should be powerful enough that higher level libraries that provide streaming solutions or web solutions are also able to provide resource safety in terms of those lower level constructs provided by Zio. So okay, those are, the component, those are the criteria for a good component of the stack. The other question we could ask then is, okay, what makes a good stack overall? And what I would argue is that strong software communities have strong components across their relevant stacks. So on the one hand, if you've got too many high-level components 
and too few low-level components, then you end up with a solution that maybe is what Python has, depending on <laughs> your point of view. But you have these very high-level frameworks that like, you want to build a website, great, fantastic. We've got great tools for you to do that. But is it going to be reactive? Is it going to be asynchronous? Is it going to be efficient? Is it going to use all of the cores on your machines? Maybe, maybe not. So that's one extreme we could be on. The other extreme we could be on is we have too few high-level components. And we have, at least relative to that, too many low-level components. And the problem there is that users have to do too much work to solve their actual problems. So you could imagine if all you had was Zio, well, Zio is great, effect systems are great, but if your problem is actually, I need to do distributed computing, there's a lot of work you gotta do between having Zio and doing distributed computing. And you can come up with the same thing for a lot of actual use cases you have. And there's a real tension between these two extremes, right? We could think about it as like a spectrum of where is our weight on? Is our weight on low-level libraries? Is our weight on higher-level libraries? Or are we balanced here? And it's challenging because there's only so much time and attention that we collectively have, right? Each of us some of us maybe have almost no time to contribute to <laughs> open source software. Some of us have a lot, but however much time we have, we've got to allocate that scarce time between these different areas. And the other dynamic we have is that it's not just one of us, but it's a group of us. And groups of humans aren't typically entirely rational. We not only kind of do our own things, but we follow what other people are doing. We follow trends. And so it's easy for a community to get into a situation where maybe we emphasize one side of this more than the other. So where are we in the Scala community? Let me maybe, I'll, I'll offer you my, my own point of view shortly, but let me, let me do maybe a little poll here. Uh, do you feel like the Scala community is are we more biased towards low-level solutions or high-level solutions, uh, or components, I'll say, in, in kind of the open source libraries that exist in Scala? Let me, let's have a raise of hands for a low-level. Okay, how about high-level? Okay, interesting, all right. Well, we will, uh, I'll, I'm gonna try to convince you actually the opposite of this. So let's, uh, let's see where we go here. So I'm going to try to convince you that we actually have too much of a focus on low-level components and not enough of a focus on high-level components overall within Scala. And clearly this is, this is not a all-or-nothing thing. There are definitely higher-level components that exist, and I think just at this talk we've had some fantastic presentations on people who have been building higher-level solutions, right, whether it's conductor that's using Zio and streams to give us this observability in Kafka, whether it's uh, what we saw with uh, Zio streaming and Zio uh, Pravega. Uh, there are definitely higher level components that exist. Um, but I, at least my point of view is overall, we tend to be biased towards these lower level components. Uh, if I look at the kind of top Scala libraries that exist, uh, in, the, in the open source world, right? We've got lots of libraries for JSON encoding and decoding. We've got lots of alternatives, we've got lots of benchmarks between them, we've got aggressive competition between them. You look at effect systems. Effect systems are low level. We're gonna come back to this more, but effect systems are basically the lowest level you could get being above the SCAL language itself. We've got multiple effect systems. They compete against each other very aggressively. <laughs> we have lots of benchmarks between them. Uh, we've got lots of libraries for functional abstractions. Again, basically the lowest level you can be above the Scala language itself. We've got multiple versions of them. They compete against each other. You want to go higher level? Well, Spark was originally written in Scala, but at this point, Spark is not a reason you use Scala. You get the same thing in, in Python. Uh, Akka maybe is higher level, but 
ECA at this point is becoming closed source. Uh, you look at a lot of different applications, machine learning, is there kind of a go-to machine learning library in Scala? I don't think really right now. Web frameworks, we have maybe one, one and a half very high level endpoints type frameworks. Library for distributed computing, not so much. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna try to convince you that we actually have had too much relative focus on these lower level components and encourage us as a community to focus more on how we build these high level components. Uh, but let's, let's kind of explore that and I'm gonna try to build up to that actually looking at, at three things. Uh, coming back to some of the things that I, I was just talking about. Uh, so first I wanna look at education. Second I wanna look at libraries. And third I wanna look at users. So let's start with education. How many folks here did the uh, Coursera course from EPFL on Scala? Yeah, I, I did too. So I absolutely love this course. Uh, or I guess it was a set of courses, it was five of them. Uh, I, I, I loved it and obviously I drank the Kool-Aid because now I program in Scala and I speak at Cala, Scala conferences. So mission, mission accomplished there. Uh, and I thought there were a lot of really fantastic things in those courses of, you know, I learned about the implementation of lists and lazy lists, and there were a lot of things that I found very like mind expanding of, I don't know if folks remember, there was that like block source thing where you kind of view like the stream as the like expansion of all possible states of the world and you like explore the stream. And I thought that was like really, really cool. Um, so I think there was a lot of like fantastic stuff in those courses that, um, you know, really kind of help, helped me and I think partly um, that kind of focus on really understanding kind of how things are done of like, okay, let's implement generators, let's do all these things, probably do, does help you become a better engineer. Uh, but, and at least I went back recently before this talk and I kind of looked through the courses again, I don't think we ever used a single web client in one of those uh, courses. Uh, so there's, there's kind of this interesting dichotomy of like you learn all these like really valuable things, but there's almost like there's, there's like a valley of like death that you go through of like you learn these really valuable things, but then you're like, okay, if I want to use them with something that's not like integers or something that's kind of already given to me, if I need to like get this from the web or I need to get this from a file, like I didn't really learn how to do that. Um, and I think there may be reasons for that of like, if you do, you have to pick a library and we'll kind of come in a minute to like issues with the libraries that are out there and kind of having to do that. Uh, but you know, it's, it's kind of, I think, an interesting observation going through those courses. And I think it's particularly interesting if you compare it to say another set of courses. Um, so another one that I, I did back in the day was this uh, Python for Everybody, which was also on Coursera, also five different courses by a well-known university. Um, and it's really striking the difference in approaches between those two. Uh, so that one, I mean, I think also great courses, but really interesting that essentially in those courses, no coverage of implementation. Like you learn about this list data structure and as, as far as you took away from this class, a list might be implemented by there being a fairy inside my computer and when I prepend an element to the list, the fairy takes it and puts it in its pocket and when I get an element from the list, the fairy takes it out and displays it to my console. There's, right, I don't know how the list is implemented, I just know here's what I do with it. I, I can get something in it, I can map over it, I can sum it, I can index into it, I can do these things. Uh, now, again, there's, there's a lot to be said on the negative side for that. Of, I think there's a lot to be said for really understanding what this thing is and what its algorithmic complexity is and being able to implement it yourself. But there's also something to be said for, look, most of us are not here to implement data structures. Most of us are here to do whatever we want to do and let's just understand how we use this data structure to do what we want to do. And on the flip side, they obviously they save time in those courses because they don't go over like how to a fold right versus a fold left and all of that good stuff. 
And basically from the beginning of that set of courses, you are making web requests. You're extracting data and munging the data and you're implementing a web crawler, which is probably not the most efficient concurrent web crawler, but you're implementing it. And I don't say this to, to say one of these is necessarily better or worse than the other. If, if anything, I'm probably biased towards something closer to the Scala way of doing it. But I think it's really interesting to compare those two. And I think to some extent it maybe reflects both what we in the community collectively value as well as the values that we collectively pass on to the next generation of new developers, which I would say is kind of a, a focus on getting into the implementation of whatever you're doing, kind of be able to implement it yourself from scratch versus just use the stuff out there and build something cool on top of all of it. Um, and again, there are benefits and disadvantages to both of those things, but I think there's a real difference in philosophy there that's worth reflecting on. So the second thing I want to look at here is libraries and the set of libraries that exist in Scala versus other languages. And the first point I just want to make here is this idea that effect systems are low level. Uh, and, I, and I say that being someone who is a contributor to an effect system, so I'm not, I'm not trying to say that in, in a negative way about anyone else. Um, and I don't think it's, it's necessarily negative at all, it's just kind of a factual observation. Uh, but if we're, if we're making factual observations here, I think we have to say that we as a community have spent a tremendous amount of time on effect systems and on areas related to them over the last 10 years, right? We've had lots of different variations of functional effects system runtimes. We've had lots and lots of conference talks about them. We've had lots of time on tagless final, monad transformers, talks about what is a free monad, is it a burrito, is it a box, is it a cat in a box, is it something else? We still don't really know. Um, but we spent a lot of time on that and I think what we have to recognize about these effect systems and maybe kind of the like clinching point of this idea that they're low level is uh, effect systems can make it easier for you to solve lots of problems that you have. But effect systems don't solve any problem that you actually have. And I, again, I say that being like the effect system author. So I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, in a way I'm, I'm doing the opposite of, of selling my book here. Uh, but I have this problem sometimes of I'll go, to a, I'll go to a dinner party or I'll get together with someone and they'll be like, oh, what do you do, Adam? And I say, oh, well, you know, I started this software company and we developed this open source software and we do consulting and training. And they say, oh, that's great. What does your software do? Seems like a really reasonable question, right? <laughs> and, and I struggle a little bit to answer it. And kind of the best I come up with is, well, it's a framework, so it doesn't help you solve the problem itself, but it helps you solve your problem that you, is the problem that you need to solve. And okay, that's kind of like a cheeky answer. Uh, but there, there's really a reality to that of like, no one, came, no one ever came and said like, what I need is an effect system. People come and they come with some like particular problem of like, I need to move this data from here to here. I need to do like, processing on this. I need to be, I need to take these requests and I need to quickly respond to them. Like those are problems people might actually have. And an effect system could help you solve those problems, but an effect system isn't actually going to solve any of those uh, problems itself. It's going to make it easier for you to do that. And I think that's like the like definitive thing you can kind of look to if you kind of ask like, is this thing, where is this thing in terms of being high level versus low level? And so I think you can think of all of this time that we've spent on effect systems as a little bit of a investment that we've collectively made, voluntarily or involuntarily, that we have to see now if it's going to pay off or not. It's like someone said, my, my family said like, hey, we need a new house, Adam, like our house is leaky, it's too small, whatever. And I said, okay, I'm gonna take the next year and I'm gonna build a great foundation for this house. It's gonna be the best foundation ever. And then I come back a year later and my family's like, okay, where's the actual house? Like, we're still in the old house. And if I now take that foundation and I build a really nice house on top of it, then maybe it was a good thing I spent all that time on the foundation because now everything is going to be super solid and fantastic. But if I don't actually build the rest of that house, 
I've kind of wasted my time building that foundation, frankly. And I think we're a little bit at that point with Scala, where we've got a lot of these lower level tools. I mean, I think whether you use Zio or you use one of its competitors, like there is, there's great functionality built in there to help you build higher level applications. And I could say the same thing for things that aren't just effects systems of we, we go back to serialization, deserialization, or persistence. We've got a lot of those components, but to really make the time pay off there, we need to start building on top of them and keep building on top of them things that are closer to problems that users actually have. And I think another way we could think about this is what are the libraries we don't have in Scala? So there, there's this problem of like, we kind of, we see the world we got, we, we don't see the world that didn't happen to materialize. And so one of the things I did is I, I looked at the top open source libraries in Scala versus in languages like Python. And I think it's really, um, again, it's really revealing of, look, we, you, you go through the Scala libraries and I think we're all in the language. It's kind of the things you would expect. We've got multiple different effect systems. We've got a couple different web frameworks. We've got some libraries for persistence. We've got lots of libraries for serialization. We've talked before about we've got Spark there, though that's kind of not fully Scala now. We've got Akka, they're going through their issues. Um, but then you look at something like Python and you see a whole set of things that just don't really show up. Um, so like there's Keras, right, library for machine learning that if you ever do one of these like machine learning competitions, that's basically like the library that you would use. Uh, there's a library specifically for facial recognition. There's a library for web scraping. There's a library for voice cloning. And you know, each of these things, by definition, being kind of close to a specific need, a lot of times you may not have that need, right? Voice cloning may not be the need you have today. But there are a lot of those. And when you end up having a lot of them, you get to a point where you say, well, look, if I want to build something and I don't want to re-implement any of these things, there's a lot of stuff I can use here versus maybe in Scala, it's like, well, look, I can, I can implement those myself, but those are not available off the shelf for me in the same way. And then the final thing that I would look at is users. And the way I think about this is users come to a software community because they're trying to solve some problem they have, because there's something they want to do. And maybe that's they want to analyze climate change trends. Maybe that's they want to trade cryptocurrency. Maybe that's they want to create AI-generated art. And I, I kind of intentionally pick those examples to be a range of things that, depending on your point of view, you might think the first one's fantastic and the second one's terrible, and the third one is either great or silly. But part of being kind of a software language is, at least within the bounds of the law, people can kind of do whatever they want with it, and some of those things you may think are fantastic, and some of those you may think are not the greatest things, but kind of people come to it and they get to do what they want with it. And in each of those cases, as a user, what you want to do is you want to be able to operate at the highest level of that software stack possible that's closest to your problem domain. The odds are there's not a software solution that exists in your exact level because then you wouldn't essentially have a job, but you want to be able to operate as close to that level as possible. So if you're the person who's supposed to do this climate change analysis, you want to be able to just describe that transformation, probably in a SQL or Spark-like way, right? You want to say, like, look, I want to load these five files. I want to put them all together into one. Then I want to, like, map the latitude and longitude to, like, group it into some area. And then I want to, like, calculate the difference between two years. And that's, you basically want to take that and you want to translate that into code that looks and feels pretty much like what I just described. And you don't want to do anything else. And similarly, if you want to do your crypto trading strategy, you want to be able to make these trades using some API provided by the exchange, ideally. Or if that doesn't exist, you at least want to be able to use some high-level web framework that lets you do that. In a perfect world, you'd probably like a trading API, but that may not exist or be publicly available or <laughs> be something you want to use. 
right? If you're doing this AI-generated art, you want to say, well, look, here's, right, here's my PDF, here are the parameters to it, I want to go there. And in each of those cases, what you don't want to do is you don't want to be forced to go down to lower levels. So if I'm, if I'm doing that data analysis of climate change interaction, I don't want to be forced to deal with any of these details about like how I'm opening or closing these files, right? I want to just say like, hey, here are the files, here's where they are, and I want everything else to be handled for me. I don't want to deal with issues about sharding or what the parallelism should be. I want that to, at least as a starting point, have some level of default values that make sense for me, and I definitely want the ability to customize that if I need to, but I want that to just work for me out of the box, at least in a common case, right? If I'm doing this web service, I don't want to worry about details of serialization. I want that to just be handled for me. If I'm using machine learning models, I want to be able to describe at a high level, well, look, I want to use this model. Maybe I want to tune some high-level parameters. I don't want to deal with everything else that goes into those models. And I think, unfortunately, what a lot of times we have in some of the libraries we do have is we, we end up leaking some of those implementation details. Uh, so, so I've got here, uh, this is actually from the talk that Brian gave a, last month, um, kind of the opposite of something that is complex. This is probably the epitome of simplicity. Um, this is kind of one of these examples from this like Scala toolkit of here we just want to make this web, web web request uh, from this URL here. And I think it's pretty hard to uh, think about how this could be made more simple. We're creating this client here, and then we're sending this basic request. Uh, this right, seems like almost the simplest way we could do this. And I think what's striking about this is actually that this is exceptional, that this had to be kind of called out as a special thing that uh, comes in this toolkit that needs to be promoted. And I think the reason it does is because some other libraries have like a different approach where you need to deal with like a Kleisley or a Monad or a Functor to um, kind of run and get and work with your web request. And I would actually submit that that is an implementation leak at some level, that all of those abstractions may be fantastic for you to structure your program, but what you're doing when that's part of your API is you're essentially forcing your users to deal with those abstractions. And if we go back to what we said about like what this user is trying to do, what's the user trying to do? They're trying to just get this probably not very interesting data from httpbin.org. They're not trying to deal with monads or functors or Kleisleys or work with category theory. They're just trying to get this data. And so it, it's, it's kind of a problem that you need to know these things to work with some of these uh, APIs. Right? You should be able to define a web client and get something with it without knowing anything about functional programming. And that should be kind of a go-to basic thing that is not, is not special, is not <laughs> controversial, does not require being... Uh, you know, promoted or being made available in any special way. So where, where are we overall? Um, at least my, my point of view, and, and hopefully I've, I've convinced you of this with these examples here, is that we as a community tend to be weighted more towards this side of lower level components. That I, I think just ideologically a little bit. We, we like to get into the weeds. We're, we're excited about implementing something ourselves of not just kind of taking the thing for granted, but building it from the ground up. And, you know, I think we even saw that a little bit at the, at the conference, and I've definitely seen it at previous conferences of, like, let's not just take these category theory abstractions. Let's, like, build them up again for ourselves. Let's have another library to do, you know, pick your topic. Um, and you know, again, in, in a way, that, that's great, right? I think that reflects some really good uh, maybe instincts of like we're, we're, we're 
tinkerers and we want to kind of get into things and we want to make sure we really understand them, but there's a risk there that kind of we, we keep reinventing the wheel and we never put the wheels together to drive the car. So where do we go from here if, if you do agree with that uh, analysis? And I, th I think where we want to go clearly is we want to make that investment pay off. Uh, we want to build a flourishing set of higher level libraries that are based on this strong foundation that we've already built. And I would propose a kind of three different parts of, of how we do that. Uh, and so I'll, I'll cover each of these in more detail, but the first one is celebrate successes at, at all levels of, of the stack. So at the same time as I'm saying, look, I think overall we're, we're overweighted towards the low level and we need to shift towards higher level libraries, uh, people are gonna contribute at different levels and com contributions at all of those levels are necessary and valuable and should be celebrated. Um, so that, that's kind of the first point and I'll hit on that more in a second. Uh, second point though is at the same time as we celebrate everything, I think we can try to do more to encourage the development of these higher level components. So we really have a um, set of solutions that covers the entire um, stack here and really delivers, like if you come as a user with high level set of needs, really delivers kind of everything you need in a very robust way. And then I think the final thing is what I call simplify all the things, uh, which builds a little bit on uh, Martin's talk this morning about uh, simple Scala, but essentially I think in addition to simple Scala, we need simple Scala libraries. Uh, and I'll, I'm definitely gonna have more to say about that. So, so the first point is just celebrate. And I, I, I really wanted to emphasize this because I want to make sure that when I say that I think we need to shift our focus that I'm not being negative at all about um, contributions at those lower levels of the stack. Because I, I think it's a little bit like if you have your iPhone or you've got a Mac here, like it's a, it's a combination of the high level and the low level, right? Of like, at least without being too biased about Apple, like I think there's a, there's a very nice user interface there. That's one of their points of differentiation. But there's also very, there's been a ton of work that's gone into the hardware there for your phone to kind of make these chips be as battery efficient and as high performance as possible. And those things come together to overall create this solution that is a pretty great solution overall. And I think we need to view um, Scala a similar way of we need contributions at all levels of the stack and all of them are important and different people may have different uh, just interests or inclinations. I mean, obviously, I'm, most of the work I do is contributing to Zio, which I've just said is, is low level. So, uh, you know, I think that's great too. Obviously, we heard this morning about uh, Caprici, which is in a way even, even lower level, is kind of the base level that everything is built on. And if that can get where it's going, that's gonna be tremendously valuable for everything that's built on top of it. So all of those things are important and should be celebrated. So that's, that's kind of point one. Uh, but point two is uh, what, what, I'm, what I hope I'm doing here is encouraging all of us to think about how at the margin we can be doing more to develop these uh, components that are higher up the stack. And I, I think for each of us that may mean different things, but I think things to maybe think about is how are you spending your own time? Uh, so if you are spending time on open source, uh, maybe think about what you're doing, where is that on the stack, and is that reflecting kind of your own passion, and is there something you'd be passionate about that maybe is a little bit closer to um, the needs that a user might ultimately have. Uh, one of the things I often uh, advise people when they're interested in contributing to Zio is I actually say, look, Zio is great, don't, don't necessarily contribute to Zio Core because Zio Core is actually pretty mature at this point, but look at some of these libraries, whether it's right, Zio HTTP. There's a ton of development that's going on right now and that's moving at least one level higher up the stack. Um, so just 
one, thinking about how we spend our time. Uh, two, maybe thinking about how we, how we teach. Uh, so, and and I, I may be guilty of this too, of I do this uh, symposium series every week where I do live coding and uh, I probably do a lot of time on, you know, let's see how this thing is implemented. Let's see how that thing is implemented. And I think that can be very valuable, but I think maybe we can, all of us who are involved in teaching in one way or another, we can think about how do we maybe bring a little bit of that, uh, of that Python ethos into what we're doing. And maybe some of this idea about like the um, simple Scala tools is like one way to do that, of if we have easy ways of having web frameworks and some of these tools, then it's easier for us to pull those into what we're doing and kind of start building things on top of that that get a little bit closer to someone who's just has a particular thing they want to do. They're like, look, I want to, I want to grab all the articles in the New York Times and I want to do some textual analysis to see if they're biased in some way that I think they are. Right, that's something that I think should be very easy to do with Scala and that we should kind of have examples to um, encourage. Uh, related to that, how we, how we mentor others. So if we're, in addition to kind of our own work, writing code ourselves, if we're um, working with others, if we're um, pairing with them or advising them, uh, is, are there ways we can encourage them and maybe help them see opportunities uh, higher up the stack? And then just how we, how we communicate about things. I mean, maybe this, is, this conference is a good opportunity to think about that of what do we talk about at conferences? Uh, it, kind of my experience of going to Scala conferences is I see, I see lots of talks about, you know, let's, let's understand or let's re-implement monads or some other, right? Let's, let's do our own toy effects system. Lots and lots of stuff about that. And less about, you know, here's this cool app that I built. Uh, again, there's probably value for both, but maybe we're thinking about relative emphasis there. And then the final thing is uh, simplify. And so uh, my perspective here is that simplicity isn't just good for the Scala language. Uh, so we, we, we heard about all these efforts underway to make the Scala language itself simpler and simple overall. Uh, I think Light libraries in Scala, at least major libraries, need to be simple themselves. And we'll talk a little more about what that means. Uh, and so the way I think about it is we should have libraries in complex domains, but we shouldn't have complex libraries. Right? Our libraries should kind of reflect the minimum possible complexity of the domain. And if anything, they should try to take that complexity and, and wrangle it down to the simplest thing it can possibly be versus just being complex for the sake of being complex. Uh, and I think the this, this Scala Toolkit initiative is, is an interesting way to, to think about that. So uh, as we heard this morning, this is this idea of promoting this set of um, simple libraries that kind of maybe askew uh, asynchrony, maybe askew kind of handling errors as values, um, but just let us, let us quickly get things done, right? Let us do that example of like the web client where like, look, I just, wanted, I just want to go to this website and get the data from it as a string and do something with it. And I understand there are a million problems with that, but I just want to do that right now. And I don't want to deal with all of those problems. So I think, as, as you can imagine from everything I've been saying here, I think the motivation for this is 100% in, in the right place. Uh, and if I put myself into kind of the, the language designer's shoes, I, I can see exactly where it's coming from. Because right, you, you say, look, we have this language that used to be the simple language that people in India or people at colleges all learn from and they could learn as kids. And now we have people who are saying it's complex or I can't hire developers in this language. And right, we've, we've had talks about simpler Scala and things that Scala 3 was doing to make it simpler for years. And still, we have these libraries where it's very complex to do something like a web request. So look, at a certain point, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it myself. And so here we are, and here is this set of simple libraries. And so, OK, that's all well and good. But I think it actually reflects a failure on the part of the open source ecosystem, that you need to do that. 
And let, let me break down a little bit why I think that's the case. And you know, I don't think there's any intention behind the initiative to, to say that, but I think it is the, it, that is the reality. Uh, and, and the basic issue there is what the need for that implies is that these other libraries are not simple for the simple use case. Uh, that we have to avoid these concepts like asynchronous computation uh, to make something beginner friendly. And so that means that essentially these libraries have failed to do what Scala itself is doing. Right? The whole idea of Scala is supposed to be this scalable language. It's supposed to scale with us. So if we want to do something simple, then we can just do that with Scala. And if we want to do something really complex, we can do that with Scala as well. And what this um, idea of kind of these simple libraries seems to be saying is that the same thing isn't true for libraries, right? That uh, the libraries can't scale with you. That you, instead of being able to have kind of one library that scales with you for everything you need, from your simple use case to your complex ones, we need these different ones. Which I think if we signed on to the initial premise of Scala is, is fundamentally unattractive, right? And, and kind of inconsistent. That the whole idea of Scala was like, look, it's nice to be able to use the same thing all the way versus having to like switch, having to use like one language for one thing and then, oh, now that we, you know, we, we started with the simple language, this toy language, and now we want to do real stuff, now we need to do a completely new language. What this is kind of saying is a little bit of the same thing of like, well, you know, we need to start with the like simple HTTP library so we can just do something because other stuff's too complex. But then, oh, if you want to do any actual real thing in production at a company, then you need this com completely different library, which is, is disappointing if that's true. And what I would really encourage, and what I think all libraries in Scala need to work for is they need to be simple enough that they can scale that way with users. And so here I've just taken a simple example with Zio. But this is, this is kind of the hello world with Zio. And I think it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, obviously we could debate how simple it is, but you extend this Zio app default and then what you want to run goes here. And here, this console.print line is synchronous, so that'll be completely fine. But I could also make what goes in here asynchronous, and that would also be fine. That would also work. And again, right now, I don't really care about errors. I'm not doing anything to handle errors. They're just going to become failures of my application. But if I want to have errors here, I can have errors here. I can have scoped resources here, and that will be tracked at the type level, not in as fine grained a way as we'll eventually get with Capressi, but that's gonna be tracked at the type level right now in code you can download today. And there's no type classes or monad transformers here. So like one thing from um, the, the talk last month was where I was saying, look, if you have one monad, that's great. One monad is no problem at all. It's when you have these different monads, and you have monad transformers, or you have tagless final, or you have all these things, that you have problems. And Zio is exactly that. It's this one, uh, one monad. And so, again, I'm not gonna, it's not as fine-grained as what we're going to get with Capresse, but Zio is, is today, and you know, I don't know if Capresse is five years from now. I'm not sure exactly what the timing is, but it's not, it's not today. And so like, here's what that uh, web request example looks like with uh, Zio, with Zio HTTP. And so again, we extend this Zio app default. We do this client.request. Now we do, we do this provide default client thing, which is kind of our equivalent of if you, look, if you go back to the STP example, they had, they had like a val client equals their equivalent of client.default here. So there's some complexity here of like, well, what is this provide thing? And I need to call this provide thing. Uh, so is, is this perfect? You know, I don't know. We can debate that. We can try to improve that. But it seems like it goes a pretty large distance towards being simple here. And I think that's what we need. We need libraries for complex domains, not complex libraries. We need to have a ruthless focus on simplicity in the open source libraries that we have in Scala. And we need to keep asking ourselves, how could this be even better? Folks who've been following the ZO2 development process know that just like 
with Scala 3, there were a lot of things that got deleted on the way to ZO2 in the name of simplification. And that also applies even in complex domains. So as an example of that, there's a library in the ZO ecosystem called ZO Schema, which I would say is probably one of the most complex libraries in the ZO ecosystem in terms of its like actual code, how difficult it is to contribute to, the concepts that it's talking about. Uh, and what it's doing is it's trying to describe the structure of data as data itself. So if you have some case class person, it's not describing any particular person, but it's just describing the structure of that thing, of it having two fields, and those fields being a string and an int. Uh, but trying to do that in a way where you could describe almost any possible data, and you can derive codex based on it. You can diff that data, you can patch it, you can merge it, you can migrate it. And it's a, it's a serious code base. There's very many cases of enums and products and sets and maps and transformations between them because we have to support this diffing. There is a lot there. It is a, it is a tough library to uh, contribute to, I would say, one of the toughest in the ZO ecosystem. Uh, but despite that, the user interface is actually still pretty simple. So here we've got this, this person that's got a name and an age, and we're going to derive a schema for it. And again, the schema is this super complex ADT that probably has 50 different subtypes to it. But we don't really care about that because we're going to do this derive schema.gen and we're going to automatically derive a schema for this person data type. And then we're, we have a schema. We can create a JSON encoder or decoder for it. We could also create one for Thrift or Avro or Protobuf or what have you, but right now we'll do JSON. And then we'll use that encoder and we'll encode this particular person. And we'll run that and print that out and we'll get the JSON. And so I think this is, this is the kind of thing we need to be striving for where this is definitely a complex domain. This is one of the most complex domains I think you could have within that ZO ecosystem. But this code is pretty simple. And I think that's what we we'll always need to be pushing for of complex domains, not complex libraries. And I think that's kind of the idea of Zio overall. So if you say, where is Zio going? Uh, we're focused on moving up the stack. Just like I've been, we're, we're trying to <laughs> follow what we preach. So our focus areas right now are streaming, having a great web framework, and having a great solution for distributed computing. Uh, there are even higher level solutions that could be built on top of those, but those are definitely moving up the stack closer to uh, user pain points. We are very focused on simplicity in everything we do. Hopefully you can see in these examples that we try to make things as simple as we possibly can. And I think all of these we're continue to work and we're continuing to accept feedback on how we can make them even simpler. Uh, and we're definitely not perfect. We're, it's a journey of continuous improvement here. But it's a journey that uh, I think some of you are already taking with us and I'd, I'd invite everyone to take with us. So, in conclusion, I don't think we have enough high-level libraries in Scala. I would ask all of you to think about what we can do collectively to create those libraries. And I would say Zio is, is one great foundation to build on there. Obviously, I'm biased, uh, but I think Zio is one great foundation to build on. So with that, I want to first thank all of you for attending and for taking the time today. Uh, I want to thank the conference organizers for making this event possible. This has been really, really incredible. Uh, anyone here who's using uh, Zio or watches this later, I want to, I want to thank you for, uh, one, just putting your, your trust in us. I think, you, uh, I think it, it really is an act of putting trust in us to use our software, uh, and I want to honor that trust. Uh, and I also want to thank you for your feedback. Uh, feedback from Zio users has been incredibly important in helping us uh, continue to improve and get where we are today. Uh, if anyone here, I think I know there are some folks who've done pull requests to Zio, who've added features. Uh, again, thank you for your work and insights. Uh, it, it's very much kind of a collective effort and one that I hope more people will be a part of in the future. Uh, and then uh, finally, he couldn't be here today, but I want to thank uh, John DeGoes, who's uh, really uh, built an incredible community uh, around Zio. Um, and uh, 
yeah, with that, I will, uh, I will wrap it up here. And uh, again, thank you so much and look forward to talking with you more uh, at the after party. Thank you.